The Community's Strategic Plan is the community's vision for the Central Coast for the next 10 years. It's called One Central Coast because this is the first plan for the whole of the Central Coast. We are one region, one council and one community. We live in a special place here on the coast, one in which we want all members of our community to feel valued and have access to a range of opportunities to participate in the richness of community life. And every one of us can play a part in bringing this community vision to life. If people feel part of a community in some way, they'll give without even probably even knowing they're doing it. I wanted to restore this building and get it back to what it was. It was the jewel of the crown and I wanted to get it back to that. Making a difference, I guess that's what we're really here for. The smile on the faces when they see these engines and that bus coming around, they just love it. If you're following what makes you happy and excited and interested, then you're definitely going to live a life that you will be thankful to have lived. At the end of the day, we just had a good idea. We needed the support of many people to turn that great idea into a sustainable venture. My name's Tim Silverwood. I grew up on the Central Coast. It wasn't until I got a bit older and started travelling around the world, I realised that what we had was so special because people don't always treat the environment as well as we do here on the Central Coast. Our programs have focused on going into schools and running events in communities. So we also have a huge global online audience. One man cannot solve these big global problems. It's going to take a tribe of people coming together to solve them. It's a really amazing and rewarding journey in, in spreading this message around the world. I've always been on the coast and I've loved the coast. About six years ago I got the Chapman building. I, I got the opportunity, I saw that it was for sale and I stood back on the car park up there and a village central and I looked down and you know I could just feel this was the place to be. I could just see what the town was. There's always these little niches that are, you know, going back and forth and, you know, I guess it's an obsession for all of us because we saw what Wyong was like and it's getting it to a place where, you know, we're proud to say we're from Wyong. Like it's become a real proud place to be. My name's Chris Wallace, myself and my wife uh, we own Community Fire Education and the Fun Engine. We educate the community in a different way. We teach people what to do in case of fire. One of the biggest things is, is our education bus. What we do, we go out to different fates, festivals, wherever we can go. When we do the, the bus sometimes, we get 2,000 through that bus. I just enjoy communicating and getting out there and just educating in a different way. I'm Meredith Gilmore. I've lived on the coast since 2000, originally from Sydney. Chose the coast because it's close to Sydney, but it's it's got that more laid back kind of thing that I like. I've, I like li living in regional areas. I started visual art in my 40s. It's just so different from what I ever thought that I'd ever do. And it, it is what led me into thinking it would be great to, to talk to people in the arts on the radio. So I started doing some shows, particularly a program called Coast Arts, which was a new show and I reached out into the community because I'm an artist as well. And I just felt like there was a lot of scope on the radio to do interviews with artists and poets and writers and that's been going now for over seven years. My name is Shana O'Brien. I am from the central coast of New South Wales on dark and young land and I'm a dancer. As an Indigenous dancer, we're very inspired by the environment and where we come from. All of the trees, the way that they curve around all of the rocks and the sea faces, the beautiful water, the fresh air, and that plays a huge part in the creative process. I was lucky enough to study at NASA Dance College, which was a super incredible experience. And the facilities, the studios are really beautiful, the staff are incredible, and I feel very privileged to have had the opportunity. Through volunteering, I was able to meet a bunch of really great other young people in the community that are really passionate about helping other people, and that's a way of taking something that I'm very passionate about and sharing that with other people. No matter where I go to work or uh, if I have to spend a lot of time in Sydney, I always come back to the Central Coast because it feels like home and it helps rejuvenate me. 
One of the things about the Central Coast I've noticed as well, which is people are so helpful to each other. They collaborate, they are interested in going to each other's exhibitions, not just to see what people are doing, but so that there are people there and you've got to be competitive, but you don't have to always be competitive with each other. If you're in a position to make a difference, I guess you're obliged to make that difference, really. Just happy to, you know, give it all I could and it became, you know, a local icon and a buzzing taste of bait.
apologies for keeping you waiting. I've been outside talking to some people upset about rate increases. Um, I'll be with you in a minute. Okay, um, again, apologies for keeping you waiting. Uh, I was out the front uh, talking to uh, 20 or 30 people who um, wanted to discuss rates, possible rate increases. Um, I'd like to uh, start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land, the dark and young people, and pay my respects to elders past and present. I'd also like to welcome you all to this meeting and all of the people who are coming in by webcast, either now directly or uh, in the future. Just to, uh, I suppose, to indicate how many people are interested in what's happening at the council at the moment, uh, there were over 3,000 uh, visits to the last to the, to the website for the last council to watch the last council meeting, which is a, a very large number uh, compared to the usual. Um, as I say, very large degree of community interest. Um, I'm going to declare the meeting open. It's being webcast, so please be careful what you say, particularly the people who are coming forward to speak. Uh, you are liable if you defame people or say the wrong thing uh, in that regard. Um, and also, I'd like to thank you all for complying with the, the COVID safe plan. Uh, it's obviously something we're all living with and uh, hopefully uh, for not too much longer. Having uh, opened the meeting, I'm now going to adjourn it to allow for what, what I'm calling the open public forum, which will be held... Uh, uh, before each council meeting, so I'll resume the meeting when we have the forum. There are there are five people who put their name down to speak. There are also 11 speakers who want to speak on the development control plan when we get back to the, the full meeting. So I, I, I tend to try and err on the side of letting people run over a bit, but given that we have 16 speakers tonight, I think it's important. I, I, I let the 11 people all speak because the, a DCP is a big issue, one of the biggest issues that come to a council. And I felt, given that there are no elected representatives here, it was important to let them have their say and for me to hear their say. So uh, I'm going to uh, limit you to three minutes. Those of you that come along with, with prepared documents, if you've already put in the document, uh, my advice to you is don't waste your time just rereading the document. So, so if you, I, I know not everyone's comfortable with public speaking, but just try and make your points uh, and uh, get that across. Uh, the first person that I'm going to call is uh, Stephen Sizer. Welcome, Mr. Sizer. Thank you. I have uh, two points to raise today. Before I do so, I'd just like to state that I'm not disputing the seriousness of the financial situation the council is facing or questioning whether the proposed rectification measures are necessary, nor am I a practicing or qualified accountant. I would also like to point out that my analysis is based upon publicly available information, which is woefully out of date. However, given that people will lose their jobs, publicly owned assets will be sold, rate costs will increase, and additional debt will be incurred, I feel I have a duty to engage with this process and raise these points. Mr Administrator, the first point I'd like to raise is with regards to the reporting and discussion of the state of the Council's budget. In your 30-day report, you outlined operating losses in recent years and a forecast loss of approximately $115 million for this financial year. Whilst this is technically correct from a statutory reporting perspective, I would urge you to consider the lens under which these statements are being viewed and the audience who is interpreting them. 
The vast majority of Central Coast residents, myself included, are not accountants and do not understand the nuances of different accounting methods or their implications. In your interim report, you interchangeably use the terms loss and deficit. I believe this to be misleading with no suggestion of intent to do so. For example, in financial year 2018, indeed the council did incur a statutory loss of $22.7 million. However, that was only after applying depreciation and amortization expense of $139 million. Depreciation and amortization is a non-cash item. That means that there is no impact to cash reserves from it. It is effectively a tool for businesses to create a paper loss in order to reduce tax liabilities by making their revenue seem lower than what it actually is. Tax liabilities, of course, the council don't have to pay. As such, depreciation and amortisation are not relevant on the council's income statement. Once depreciation and amortisation are removed from the council's paper losses for financial years 2018 and 2019, the council actually had budget surpluses of roughly $116 million and $140 million respectively. The headline loss excludes grants and contributions that are specifically for capital projects. However, the headline loss also includes depreciation and amortisation expense for capital projects. Mr Sizer, you've got 20 seconds left if you want to start to wind up. <laughs> Um, the Local Government Code of Accounting Practice and Financial Reporting clearly states that depreciation expense in the financial statement should not be used as a proxy to fund future funding requirements or as a mechanism to set users' charges or rates. Okay. Thank you very much. While we're doing a little COVID cleaning here for the next speaker, I might get Mr Hart to uh, deal with the issue. Uh, I'm not an accountant either, and uh, I think the topic you've raised does confuse a lot of people. Uh, but uh, Mr Hart will give you a, a clear as the error explanation. Uh, thank you, Mr Administrator. Look, um, in response to Mr Sizer's points, I, he, whilst he did not have an opportunity to present points two and three, I would c concur there is some value in having a look at those uh, particular points. However, point one, uh, depreciation is a non-cash item. I've heard that many times since coming from the private sector into, uh, into, pub into the public sector, and I have to say it definitely applies in the private sector. There's no question about it. It's a tool that is used to ensure that the uh, shareholders take home a little bit more than they might have otherwise. However, in government, our assets are pretty much fixed. If we take a road, for example, it must be maintained and looked after. If you have a look at our PL and our income and expenditure, you will see the only line that funds that sort of work is called the depreciation line. So that depreciation line provides for the renewal and maintenance and ongoing keeping of the asset in the current condition. If we don't do that and we don't spend on average that amount of money every year, the total of today's value would be around about $170 million. If we don't spend that every year on across our whole asset portfolio, then in that case, we are going backwards with our assets. And when it comes round to actually having to put a new roof on the stadium or to replace the turf on a, on a field or whatever, then where do we find the money from? Because the only source of money is actual fact what we get from our income and expenditure, which is expensed every year. So you see there's no means to actually keep money to do it for anything because the reserves, the restricted reserves, are for specific purposes, whether it's water, sewer, waste, or Section 94, in the, today's word, 7-Eleven. Thank you very much, Mr Hart. If you'd like to talk more to either Mr Hart or Ms Cowley after the meeting, uh, which will be about an hour and a half, I reckon, uh, you're welcome to stay around and do so. Thank you for raising the issue. I've, I've often asked that question, but I, I, I accept the answer, and I think you might after you hear from them. And Mr Harris, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ready to go? Yep. Um, there are two problems I delivered to tonight's meeting. One is the fake traffic management study presented with DA 54551, and two is the failure of council staff to formally respond to my questions regarding their treatment or otherwise of the fake study. The fake study's traffic survey was carried out on one day for a short time in the AM and PM. 
where a standard council survey continues for two weeks, and the two weeks' advice is from council staff. This is a misleading survey. Other issues identified were provided to the council by letter and then followed up with phone calls. This is, this is the eighth attempt I've made to the council to get an answer to my questions about the fake, about the fake tra tra um, traffic study. That, that's the reason why I'm here tonight okay. instead of, okay? Um, so one of the things that I've looked through the study, and which is on public exhibition, and um, there's a lot of I issues in the, the study that I disagree with, which I haven't listed to the council. But one of the ones I, that I did, it says the 10 year design life scenario was not considered due to the relatively low magnitude of traffic generated by the proposed site in relation to background growth. Now I believe if the, the consultant's going to make any comment on that, it, need, it needs, and it wasn't in the study, to do a whole lot of research on DAs approved and either under construction or completed from prior to the consultant study which was carried out in May 2018, back up to the present date or to when the, the construction is completed. Now the construction hasn't started yet, so that means that the consultant study is two and a half years out of date. Now there's any number of major um, developments going on in the peninsula, which I believe, and I can refer to another one which was refused, that the same process will, will apply to those other developments. So what does that mean for traffic management on the peninsula? Well, it means what's, what's, what's happening now, there's been more and more traffic generated, and the, the fact is that the, the public are the scapegoats or the test dummies in relation to development on the peninsula. So all, and all the other things that have been presumed or assumed in the study can only be either um, decided by discussions with the council staff. This, the consultant can't make decisions and predict the future when the, the, the construction hasn't even begun. So the fact is, and there's no indication of when it will even be completed. So how, how can this, the consultant make, can provide a study to the, to the council in relation to a DA when it really doesn't know when it's going to be completed? All right, well, let's get you an answer to that, eh? Well, well that's the problem. All that's right, the whole well, problem. If you, yeah. your, your time is basically up now, yeah. so if you, if you return to your seat, I'll yeah. get, get okay. addressed. Yeah. Thank you. This is Mr. Cox. You're doing fake studies? Um, I don't believe so, Mr. Administrator, but um, I'd like to respond. Well, Mr. Mr. Harris is not a happy chappy, so what can, you, what, what can you say? Mr. Harris, you've got to sit down now and listen to the answer. Yeah. Go on. Um, through you, Mr. Administrator, the development that Mr. Harris is referring to was for a 34 residential unit development on the corner of Farnell, Street and uh, Blackwell Road. Uh, the matter went before council uh, a number of times. It was deferred initially. In terms of traffic assessments, traffic impacts from developments are assessed as each application is made and they look at the cumulative impacts and also the modelled background traffic growth. Um, in this particular development, um, the initial proposal was rejected by council traffic engineers and the um, RMS based on the fact that uh, Blackwall Road being a classified road and that's where the entry um, to the site was, was initially proposed. There are amendments made um, to the development application um, to take all traffic through the side street. Um, the RMS raised no objection and neither did council's traffic engineers. So uh, who would have carried out the, the traffic studies? Uh, the traffic study was undertaken by a traffic consultant. Okay. Mr. Harris, I appreciate you've been uh, unhappy about this for some time and I suspect that's going to continue. Um, I have indicated in the past that I don't want to use my time here to revisit issues that have been dealt with before and this one has been dealt with a number of times. I'm sorry I can't be of assistance to you on this occasion. I, I, uh, I think we're just going to have to agree to disagree on that one. Uh, Ms. Ms. Gay Morrells. Ms. Morrells. Welcome. Good evening, thank you. I'm here to represent a large group of concerned residents in Palm Grove and the surrounding area. And uh, we've objected. Can I interrupt you just to say, can you hear up in the gallery? Okay. Not very well. Not I've very got... well. Can we, is this, can we turn volume up or? Anyway, we'll, please. I've got such a foghorn, I'm surprised, but I'll get closer. 
I'm here to represent a large group of concerned residents of Palm Grove and the surrounding area. We've objected to and continue to object to this DA 97 2020. And we've just had a recent handing down of a decision by the local planning panel, which we are extremely disappointed with. The DA has been for a retrospective approval for an unauthorized intensive French bulldog breeding enterprise. It's been running unauthorized since July 2019. The system has been seriously flawed from the start and despite appropriate and considered intervention by council officers who have done a really sterling job, the business was permitted to entrench itself and expand over 16 months. Throughout the period, the applicants demonstrated utter contempt for the council's compliance directives to cease operation, demolish structures, and we understand to even pay fines. The council's perceived and quite real impotence in the matter resulted in extensive time and unnecessary cost to the ratepayer as a result of compliance officers, planning officers, environmental officers, and rangers all needing to be involved with no useful outcome. The applicant has delayed and prevaricated and failed to produce reports in a timely fashion. The DA was eventually submitted with inadequate reports provided in a number of key areas. The saga lives on, with the planning panel this week requesting yet another acoustic report, while we already have 16 months of diarised noise recordings, the accuracy of which has been attested to through visits by two environmental officers from council. We're a very small community. We did not employ social media. If we had done that, I cannot imagine how many objections we would have received about what is really a puppy farm. The council received 45 submissions objecting to the DA. That is a large number from a very small area. The submissions were broad-based. They addressed animal welfare, the unsuitability of the development for the local area, the impact on the public amenity, in compliance issues, and of course, noise. If you're not already aware, French Bulldogs are a breed which the RSPCA are actually attempting to ban because there are multiple serious health issues. These are very fashionable and very expensive dogs. They, they sell for between five and $10,000 a piece. And the whole business is run through very secretive operations with dogs being sold online. After months of painstaking work to ensure that due process was followed, which was exasperating for residents, Council delivered their recommendation, which was to reject the proposal. But because of the number of uh, objections received, it was an automatic referral to the planning panel. We were assured that this would be a transparent process with integrity. There would be a community representative, so we'd be, we could be sure that local concerns would get a fair hearing. What a disappointment. The process has been utterly opaque with minimal communication. We might have expected direct communication from the point of I'm, that. I'm afraid and your it's time's up. Do you want to wind up, please? Much. Can I just say one or two just things? Just briefly. <sighs> what do I say? There's so much to say. But basically, this is an inappropriate development. The process has been flawed. And how many people have to say no in a small community for no to be heard? OK, thank you very much. So, as many of you are aware, this is my ninth year as a council administrator, covering a number of different councils. And one of the things that I've learned <coughs> is how frustrating it is and how disappointed people uh, get when they run a campaign. Uh, they feel like they've got strong community support and they don't prevail. Um, when I was at Warringah Council, it was the second council in the state to set up an independent planning panel to take councillors out of the process because it usually gets down to a fairly technical matter. If there's an LEP or a DCP, it's about interpreting that. And sometimes what's wanted by the residents, I'm afraid, is not wanted, is actually allowed by the planning instrument. Uh, you mentioned that this has been to an independent planning panel. So I would say uh, most people would have confidence in that process. But I'll just ask Mr Cox to comment on this one too. Thank you, Mr Administrator. Just a little bit of background. The development application was for an animal boarding, breeding and training facility. Um, the matter went before the local planning panel on the 1st of October. 
Um, council staff's recommendation to that assessment report was for refusal. Uh, the local planning panel deferred the matter, a decision on the matter, giving the applicant um, an opportunity to provide further information, particularly in terms of uh, their acoustic report. The, um, the applicant provided an amended acoustic report that came before council staff. Council staff did a further assessment of the application. Um, and council staff then recommended that a time limited consent of 12 months be applied. Um, the panel then um, made a decision um, and, and granted that a 15 month time limited consent should be granted. And uh, were criteria set to establish whether or not it would be continued? Um, in terms of the conditions of consent placed on particularly monitoring and um, surve surveillance work. So that would be primarily acoustic impact rooms? Correct, to well, analyse well, the uh, who's, acoustic who's impacts. Who's doing that monitoring? Um, it will be staff, but we'll also rely on consultants to, um, to do some background testing will, for us. Will the council engage the consultants? Yes. Okay, well, I, I can just say, uh, Ms Morrells, I think you've actually got a half of a win there. You've, you've got an opportunity for a reassessment in 15 months, and I believe the, uh, the, the council staff have shown, it's clear from what I've just heard, that they actually oppose the development, so there should be no need to uh, have any doubt about their commitment to uh, a proper assessment of the noise impact, and I suspect uh, we'll, uh, we'll hear it about 15 months' time uh, the next stage, but thank you for raising it tonight. No, I'm sorry, I can't go. I can't run an ongoing debate with you. But thank you for raising it, and I believe it's, it will be revisited. And Ms. Gabriel, sorry, I had Liz Gabriel down. Fourth on the list. So you're speaking on the same issue on the Reptile Park? No, we speak. Well, we're speaking for the old Sydney Town site for which the Reptile Park. Oh, sorry, park I've got the wrong. I've, I've called in correctly. You're right, Jonathan Canavan. Apologies. Welcome. Thank uh, thanks for having me. Good evening to you all, and um, nice to see some of you again. Um, I just wanted to provide a quick quick update on the old Sydney Town property. There's one of the um, larger land holdings that's before council for assessment at the moment, um, and with the um, uh, proposed amendments to the current DCP, we thought it timely to come back and just provide an update as to where we are with the old Sydney Town site. Um, so for background, for those that don't know, the site was purchased um, in mid-2018 uh, and uh, earlier this year in August, a planning proposal for the 120 hectare site was submitted. Um, during the proposals, the preparation of the proposal stage, um, community consultation was undertaken um, with a series of workshops uh, and drop-in sessions over a period of about nine weeks. Um, and further further engagement with the community continues online um, through the WCTV website, which um, stands for World Cultural Tourism Village. Um, the proposal focuses on, on generating um, tourism opportunities for the region. Um, that are, that are based primarily on Australian culture and themes in history. There will be food and beverage opportunities um, as well as continued cooperation with the Australian Reptile Park. Um, we believe this site is a significant opportunity for the Central Coast to capitalise on its um, tourism offerings and potential. Um, we think there's a, a enormous potential to generate future employment um, for all sectors, both creative arts, youth um, and skilled professionals uh, and also contribute to the local environment, lo local economy's GDP. Um, we're, we're pleased to have lodged this proposal with Council uh, and note that it's currently under assessment and we're awaiting some preliminary um, feedback and, and comments from Council and um, that we look forward to working with Can you maybe just back off a little bit from the microphone? Because I think that's actually not helping. Is that better? Try again, yeah. Okay. So, how much of that should I say again? Or we? Um, well, I've I've understood you. So that's the main thing. I'm, I'm sure if the media <laughs> want to review you, they'll do so later. But um, if you could just move your mouth back a bit more, yep, you can actually hear it more clearly. Okay. 
That's good advice. So do you want, uh, just want to clarify what you're looking for from council? Well, at the moment, we, we, we're just looking for continued um, assistance with council working through the planning proposal phase. So um, we just wanted to make a point of, of a, letting everyone know that we, we have lodged that planning proposal. Um, you know, in, in, on tonight's agenda, it's a, there's an item that specifically relates to this site in terms of the um, proposed uh, amendments to the um, LEP or, or rather to preserve elements of the LEP, which we support. Um, but given that the, the amendments tonight um, relate to this site specifically and it is one of the larger um, precinct sites or one of the larger proposals under assessment by the council at the moment, uh, we wanted to have some representation here to to okay. ensure that if there's any questions of us, we can we can provide right, answers. Well, we won't do the questions now, but I'll I'll be interested of to course. hear from the staff. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Who's, who's, who, does anyone have coverage of this issue? Scott Cox. Through you, Mr. Administrator. Um, yeah, just to confirm that um, the old Sydney town site um, has uh, a history of uh, tourist style uses. Um, the Reptile Park currently still operates on the site. Um, as part of the, the draft consolidated LEP, there's been recommendations uh, to apply additional permitted uses to the site to, to ensure that those, um, th those historical uses are not lost. Um, and, and it's also identified in a number of strategies for future um, and ongoing tourism uses as well. Uh, Mr. McCarnarvon is also correct that council is currently assessing a planning proposal for the site, um, and that planning proposal is currently under assessment. Okay, thank you very much, um, Ms. Gabriel. Welcome, Australia. Um, as a representative and director of the Australian Reptile Park, we also felt it important to come and um, and voice our opinion on the development of the old Sydney Town site. As a long-standing and successful business, having operated for over 62 years on the Central Coast and 24 years on this current site, we've enjoyed uh, a success in support of the community and Central Coast Council and have also enjoyed um, success in, in developing our organisation. We continue to see a bright future for the Reptile Park at this site and tourism on, on our site and the surrounding lands. Uh, we we support the continued activities and zoning for tourism on the lands on and surrounding our business. We've had a positive and, and very transparent relationship with World Village on the development of Old Sydney Town and, and the plans for that development. Uh, we do support the tourism activities um, to, to be developed uh, surrounding those lands and for the residential development as well. We, we don't support the development of industrial uh, on those lands and it was uh, news to us that that was the preference of council so we would like that to be clarified. Uh, we feel the development has considered the views and, and the, uh, any concerns of the Reptile Park and World Village has incorporated those into the planning and development of the old Sydney Town site and we believe it benefits the community the Australian Reptile Park, the local economy and the tourism of the Central Coast as a destination. Thank you very much. Um, okay, that gets us to the end of the open forum. Thank you for those people who uh, participated. I declare the open forum closed and I now declare the public forum open. We're, here, we're holding this public forum to hear from community members who have registered to speak on the items. I mentioned before that there was a large number wanting to speak on the, the issue of the DCP. Uh, so I think we'll get straight into that. Um, I'm not sure if I've covered all of the procedural matters. But I think um, in terms of declaring the council meeting open, I don't think anyone has anything to declare I certainly don't in relation to the matters on the agenda. Um, and the minutes of the previous meeting, I've read those and believe them to be a correct record. So I, thank you. And I move their adoption and adopt that as a decision of council. Okay, so we're going to go through 11 speakers. Uh, again, I'm going to be tough on the three minutes. There's a clock up there if you're trying to gauge how much longer you've got uh, to try and make the most of your time and making it a case. 
Uh, this issue obviously has been around for a long time. When I when I got here, I was advised by quite a number of people that this DCP should have the merger uh, should have happened a long time ago. Uh, it's a history of um, progress then delay, progress then delay. That's been frustrating, I think, for quite a lot of people. Uh, one of the reasons why I uh, uh, asked Mr. Ryan to join us as Chief Operating Officer is because he's also one of the state's most eminent planners. Uh, no disrespect to Mr. Cox, but I felt that given the importance of the issue, I'd rather have two opinions than one. Uh, and, uh, and I now have that, uh, and I'll be interested to hear their response to some of your issues, particularly those that, that may be wanting to speak against it. So the first person who wants to speak against it is uh, Brian Barry. Welcome. Thank you. And we're away. Okay, so we know what I'm talking about. Um, I'm speaking as a director of Bells at Cure Care, where um, <clears throat> my wife and I have operated that business since December 07. It's a family-owned resort, restaurant um, and day spa. We employ more than 100 people. We have an annual wage bill of more than $4 million, which is supporting the local economy. In our time there, we have um, contributed considerably to not only the economics, but the cultural value of the community. And uh, through Tourism New South Wales multipliers, we figure we're contributing more than $30 million per annum to the visitor economy. Um, we um, attract um, high disposable income clients, which further greatly assist local businesses in the community. The design and operation of our business uh, is such that it, it, it is a, a low impact tourist use. Um, despite these noteworthy merits, the planning proposal um, and changes would make Bells at Kilcare a prohibited use in zone E3, uh, E4, I'm sorry. So I'm putting forward the following. To provide planning certainty for Bells at Kilcare and the wider resident and business community of Kilcare, we respectfully ask that Schedule 1 of the Central Coast LEP be amended to list the following as additional permitted use in relation to 107 to 119 the Scenic Road, Kilcare Heights, which is Bells at Kilcare. Um, the additions being hotel or motel accommodation, restaurants and cafe. Um, we see this as a, a minor and reasonable change which uh, simply secures our existing lawful operations. The change would result in no potential environmental impacts. It would simply uh, obviate the need for Bells to rely on existing use rights, noting that the legal and planning complexities that may arise if the LEP is not amended. Okay. I'm going to invite you to just remain in your chair um, uh, and I'm going to have some answers and we'll see how we go. You, can you speak to this one? Mr Cox, yep. Thank you, Mr Administrator. Um, yes, Mr Barry um, does raise a number of issues, particularly with the potential expansion of Bells um, and, and, and most, most people know what a what a, what a quality um, development Bells is. Um, but I suppose the issue with trying to um, do a consolidated LEP for a major region, there's a number of um, sites where there may be impacts, particularly with taking out um, uses, um, particularly on sites that haven't been developed, may, may be an issue um, if they are developed for that use. Um, I asked staff whether or not a submission was was put in as part of the consultation period for the consolidated LEP, and that they've, they've advised me that they haven't. And, and I suppose where I'm going with this is whilst, whilst what Mr Barry is saying, it's not a good idea to do planning on the run, um, and it would, would need time for staff to actually do a further assessment. But it could be an opportunity through a housekeeping or uh, amendments into the future for the LEP because it's such a large document. Um, or alternatively, Mr Barry um, could move forward with a planning proposal for an additional permitted use, which may allow him then to expand, um, you know, if, it, if it's deemed appropriate, to, to so expand is, is onto adjoining property. Is there some doubt over his existing use? Uh, no, there's no, there's no query over the, the, exist, the current existing use, but I think um, Mr Barry just wants a little bit more certainty rather than relying on his existing use rights and he would like right. that use um, to okay. be a permitted use One going moment. forward. Do you have a quick reply to that? Um, we're not actually against the proposed changes. We just want to be 
the, the section one to, to cover us and on the existing block, not on any other blocks. Okay, back to you. Um, through you, Mr. Administrator, in terms of housekeeping LEPs, we normally commence them straight away because, as I said, with, with, with major um, LEP amendments, um, particularly like with the former Wyong LEP and the former Gosford LEP, there were a number of housekeeping amendments that started, that commenced immediately, um, and this could be one that could be considered as part of that process. Uh, we will do that, you're saying? Okay. I think that's a win. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Ms. Sandra Kay. Welcome, Ms. Kay. Good if evening. If I could just say by background to others here, Ms. Kay has had a long standing issue. Uh, she met with Mr Ryan this morning. Uh, they have come to a, uh, an agreement about a way forward which involves uh, the, the employment of an independent uh, planning consultant. Um, Ms Kay will put up a bond to cover the cost of that and the council will pay her if she's successful. I think under the circumstances there's probably not, not much point in going on with the detail now. No, I was... Just and I think that sounds thank to me you. like a very sensible outcome. Yes. Um, and uh, it's nice to see someone who's willing to put their money where they well, put their money up and back themselves. And uh, if you're right, we'll have a lead pay. Good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mark Ellis. Sorry, we've, we're running ahead of ourselves here because that was so quick. Welcome. Yep. Thank you for the opportunity to speak, uh, Mr. Administrator. I have sent through an, uh, an article addressing our concerns, but I just want to add a few more points in. And the point you raised earlier about LEPs and how once it's in place, it's always going to be in place. This is our issue with the E2. I'm talking about the coastal urban space system, which we've had for 30 years in Gosford City Council. It is due for expansion as well. So the problem is the E2 zone, I'll read these things out, an E2 zone is inconsistent with providing high environmental protection there that needs specific protection that is watertight. So we don't want similar incidents that's happened in the Hillbury Street of Woiwoi, wherein we had an endangered ecological community, state protecting a community which was allowed to go through by this council and the state government. And the same thing happened at Warner Vale as well. Also, an E2 zone will lead to the death of a thousand cuts, increasing fragmentation and loss of bushland that exacerbates the pressure on the native species and habitats and food resources. Because, you know, COS is more than just bushland buffer zones between industrial zones. It protects the biodiversity of the vegetation, including the endangered ecological communities, and conserves the corridors for the wildlife migration so that the diversity of plants and animals can move unaltered through the system. The objects of COS are to protect the region's ridgeline from urban development and maintain the green character, the um, village character across the sea. And if this is going to be expanded through the central coast, how is that going to be done when the cornerstone of the COS system is the bonus of provision, which is not provided in the E2 zone? The other problem is how are we going to protect the ridgelines, the main core of that, when there's no in the E2 zone? <clears throat> so the problem that we have is that for the last, I don't know, how many, 30, 20 years, Gosford Council and the community have been asking for a specific environmental zone. Now, the, count, the state government were advising we can, we can want to do it, can we want to do it, we can't want to do it. Anyway, so we are here to ask you, as the current administrator of this council, in place of the elected representatives, to please make representations to the New South Wales Minister for Planning, requesting a Pacific E5 zone for the coastal open space system. Now, this isn't just new. It has been proposed many times before. So how it basically works is that the, the Gosford Council Vision 2025 plan was the on, had ongoing support from the coastal urban space system, is assigned a, a specific subzone in the standard template to assist in the efficient delivery of the standard OIP and protect the structure and integrity of the cause as it stands as now. Or either there is structure there. There's finance, there's process, 
is recognising the Central Coast Regional Strategy as in the Community One. All through the planning documents, it says there that the protection of environment is a must on the side there. So right. that's basically our, our problem, is that we don't want to rezone our environmental lands as they're contradictory to the objectives of the biodiversity strategy, the community strategy, which is the focus of it, and the Okay, I need, I need you to wind so up. Can, can I just ask you, 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 you mentioned that it, it had been raised with the minister a number of times. What was the answer? Well, it, the answer was basically a you know, discussion in 2012. They said they were going to do it. They had a draft um, planning note actually showing what an E5 zone would look like. In 2015, the minister had discussions with the pre previous CEO of Gossip, Mr Paul Anderson. They were, okay. going, they were discussing it as okay. Right. The, L the central code, the LGC, sorry, the local government association all voted for it in 20, I think 2017 for a motion which was put by the Central Coast Council to that. The whole account, right. they all supported it. I got so that. my question is, where is it at okay. and how can you help us? Well, thank you very much for that. I'm gonna, we're going to... When you clear clear the space, I'll hear from Mr. Cox. Thank you very much. Through you, Mr. Administrator, there's probably three points I need to to um, make comment on. In terms of the E5 zone, um, I've been the author of a number of letters to um, to the Minister for Planning about a proposed E5 uh, zone um, on behalf of Council. Um, also in, in discussion with the, the uh, Central Coast um, branch of Department of Planning as well. Um, and the response is that the E5 zone is not part of the standard uh, LEP instrument, so therefore it's not a zone that can be used on um, the Central Coast. Do you think it should be? Yes. Um, That's what we're asking you. Uh, excuse, excuse, excuse me. In, in, Hang on. <laughs> Only one person can run this meeting. In my opinion, Mr. Administrator, I believe that the E2 zone is conservative enough to um, to, to protect. Okay, uh, I'm going to hear from Mr. Ryan. Mr. Ryan, you live in one of these zones, I think. Uh, that, that's true, Mr. Administrator. I do live in an E2 zone. <clears throat> I must comment that the E2 zone uh, administered by Gosford Council is quite unusual, in that it allows quite a lot of land uses that would not normally be in an E2 zone. Um, so, so this particular land, which I assume is some of the deferred lands that you're referring to. <clears throat> the proposal I'm going to implement with Mr Cox is that in the first instance we deal with the council-owned land, which is a substantial part of this, of this land, and if the E2 zone is appropriate, we'll report that straight back to you for implementation. However, I will not recommend that the current extra land uses that are currently in the E2 zone will be promulgated into those lands. So it would be the traditional E2 zone for those areas. There is quite a lot of privately owned land and crown land that will require quite a bit more investigation advice and will take a bit longer. But the primary goal of the deferral is to investigate which appropriate uh, environmental zone should apply to the land. Okay, Mr. Cox. Yeah, um, I totally agree with Mr. Ryan, but I'd also make comment too that the, the current environmental zone, zones in the Gosford, um, in, in, in the current Gosford LEP, um, a lot of those land uses have been taken out as part of this draft consolidated LEP. Um, and some of those uses which were referred to by Mr Ellis include um, bed and breakfast accommodations as such. They have been taken out of the E2 zone to... Um, okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Ke Mr Kevin Haskell. One moment. We're not, we haven't got a light on there. Okay. There you go. Uh, Mr. Administrator, Council staff, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, I'm my, I am the owner of a business called Kindy Caravans and Trailers at Erina, which I've had for 37 years there. I've had it for longer. Uh, in 1987, I went into a deed of agreement with Gosford Council, which was gazetted with the state government to um, relinquish rights to manufacture trailers on that basis. I've um, in, two, uh, in 2011, they, um, uh, the DLEP, they recommended rezoning my land. And now in 2020, uh, all they're recommending is existing use rights. This is a very poor outcome for somebody who's 71 years old, ready to retire, and existing use rights give me something that's not even saleable. It's totally unsuitable as a residential site. I employ 10 people and... Um, uh, the disposal of the deed, which is gazetted with the state government, is not right uh, in principle. And, <clears throat> and I think the nature of the land, which is um, commercially uh, rated as well by the council, uh, is incorrect. 
um, because of where it is, it's on the entrance road, 338 Central Coast Highway entrance road. Mr. Sussex, why is it unsaleable with existing use rights? Sorry? Why do you think it's unsaleable if you have existing use rights? It's not very saleable. I had somebody oh, who was interested in it before. Oh, so and it's they, saleable but not very saleable. Not as saleable. Okay. It's not as valuable, not as saleable, no. Okay, it's very on. restrictive, yep. yes. Yeah. Okay, is that all you wanted to say? That's all I want to say. I all just right, think I'm being it. mistreated, yes. Okay, thank you for raising that. Oh, wait, sorry, there is one more thing. Yep. The, the corridor, they did that corridor, supposed to be to promote tourism and everything. It actually hinges on my property. My property is the hinge where it goes to Terrigal. That's the end or the start of the corridor. Okay, thank you so, very much. So they've ignored right. that too. If I can get you to leave the seat and I'll... Over to you, Mr Cox. Um, through you, Mr Administrator. The, the current zoning for the site is um, R2, low density residential. Um, and Mr Haskell has made um, uh, submissions trying to uh, rezone that site to B5, uh, commercial use. Um, I mean, probably a similar comment to, to, like I mentioned, in terms of the Bells development. It could be something that could be considered as part of um, a housekeeping. But why uh, was it? Why wasn't it considered before? Because it's out of scope with the um, with the consolidated LEP, which didn't uh, rezone any properties. It was um, like for like zones where it, it uh, th this Mr Haskell's proposal is trying to rezone from art from a yeah, residential to a commercial, and that's out of scope. You, is there a strong case to rezone? I think it's something that staff would really need to look at the, the, the merits of the site and some of the constraints to see whether or not it should be zoned commercial. It, it's probably not as black and white as the Bells um, site that we heard from earlier on tonight. Okay. Um, I think um, I can't give you the satisfaction you're looking for right now, but I would like you to come back to me at, at some point with a bit more of a detailed response to some of the points made, going back to the agreement that was made in 87, I think. Sure, Mr. Uh, Minister. It sounds like there's a pretty strong case being made there. Uh, and maybe, uh, anyway, I, I will, I will uh, undertake to look into the issue again in more detail, and I'll, I'll write to you. Okay, okay thank you. Uh, Mr. King. Welcome. Good evening, Mr. Administrator. Um, I'm representing a selection of uh, residents from Wairima Road in Warnervale. Um, and this has been an issue that we have been uh, talking to Council about for quite some time, a number of years now. Um, we are in the Warnervale village uh, and it's a very, very beautiful place that has 1,600 metre square blocks. Um, now we see Warnervale get uh, divided up and lots of housing put in. Um, and we had a, in, 19, in 2017, we had an inappropriate development application put in for Wairima Road, um, which was eventually rejected by council as being inappropriate, but it was, uh, um, it came to light that the northern side of Wairima Road has a zoning of R2, which is low density, and the southern side of Wairima Road has a zoning of R3 or, o or R1, but it's more or less kind of open slather. And what the residents are looking for is protection for their, for their street. Um, what we discovered in 2012, the DCP um, put the draft forward uh, with a map for the Warnervale South Precinct 7A, where everything there, the, along Warnervale Road, along Wairima Road and Canowna Road behind us, in, uh, which are all the same size blocks, were uh, was zoned R2 and then for some reason when the DCP was actually ratified in 2013 that had changed the zoning for the southern side of Wairima Road and along Warnervale Road 
had been changed to R1 or R3. It's, uh, um, now, we've sent lots of letters. We've talked to different people within council. I've spoken to people in um, state government. Um, they've talked about the gateway process. They've seen um, our, the common sense in regards to having the zoning the same on both sides. Because when you look at the interpretation of zoning and R2, it's about maintaining character in the street. It's about maintaining the amenity of the street. And it's, it's, it's giving us all what we've bought into as well, which is this beautiful environment which is quite unique. Now, we understand that council with state government needs to create housing. And the green fields in Warnervale are disappearing very quickly with lots and lots of housing, and they're all very close together, a lot of them, right? But we have a unique environment. And it's a beautiful environment, and what we're attempting to do is maintain that and have the southern side of the street rezoned in this new DCP to R2. Okay. Your time's up. Thank you very much. Thank you. If you could vacate the chair and I'll prepare for the next speaker. Mr Cox. Again, uh, Mr. Administrator, um, this particular site, it, it, it's out of scope with um, the consolidated LEP in terms of the, the consolidated LEP is not up zoning and it's not down zoning. Um, there was a request um, made to councillors to consider this site for, for, for a, um, a down zoning to R2 uh, when, when the, the consolidated LEP was considered by councillors. Council staff have uh, workshopped this matter with the councillors. In terms of the history, I, I, I'm, I wasn't around when, when the, uh, the rezoning of the, the site to R1 was made, but I will make a few comments that it's not uncom uncommon for a road to, um, uh, to, to act as a, as a buffer between two different zones, going from, from a lower uh, density zone to a higher density zone. And I believe that there may have been a strategic assessment done because of the uh, proximity of the southern side of Wairima Road to the Warnervale Town Station. However, um, staff have identified that um, the, the particular site is possibly, um, should be looked at as part of the Greater Warnervale Structure Plan. And that's a project that the staff are looking at now where they're actually looking at uh, reviewing the housing densities up through there. So they'll look at it through a contemporary lens because the rezoning was made seven years ago. So they'll be looking at that um, density. Um, What's the time frame for them? Uh, 12 months, the project we're working it on. It will start in 12 months or finish? No, no, it, it, it's work that's already commenced, okay. um, but we're looking at about 12 month period. All right, thank you very much. Uh, I think that uh, there's a process that's going to go ahead in the next 12 months and hopefully uh, you'll have a good chance to put your case there. Thank you. <coughs> Ms. Diana Arundel. Welcome. Thank you. Good evening and thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, I would like to request a review I'd have to ask you to speak up a bit, I speak think. Speak up or closer? Yeah. Okay. I would like to request a review of a current lot size restriction for my property at 229 Hillside Road of Oka Beach. Um, the land size is just under 2200 square metres and there's a lot size restriction of 1850 square metres and I'd like to request that that be changed to um, 728 square metres at least. The land has been reviewed by Clark Daddle and Associates, surveyors, planners and bushfire consultants and they have said that the land is not steep as previously classified as 9C under the Gosford Planning Scheme Ordinance. There is already a slab design dwelling existing on the site which demonstrates the congeniality of the site for future dwelling houses to be erected on the land. There are much steeper lots within our two zoned land that have minimum lot sizes of 550 metres squares. Bushfire um, assessment has been done and accredi accredited by Clark Daddle and Associates. The lots would be in line with surrounding lot size. The block doesn't contain vegetation, so there'd be no environmental or biodiversity impacts. It's not flood prone. It would be urban infill only. The, incorrect, the current incorrect mapping by council devalues my land. Any additional lots would be within the character of the low density locale. 
and character is established by the owners and what they put on the land, not the size of their land. Additional lots would allow additional family housing in accordance with the Central Coast Regional Plan and additional lots would also bring in additional rates to assist paying off the current deficit. Additionally, we have a 53 metre frontage, so requesting a lot size review to 728 square metres with each having 17.6 metre frontage would still allow for three generous size blocks that fit into the surrounding neighbourhood. And also the street numbers that have been allocated just to our block of land, which is 221 to 229 Hillside Road, um, also implies that our block is set up for more than one residential. So I'm hoping that with all those things that there's enough merit to consider changing this lot size restriction to still very, three very generous lot sizes. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Mr Cox. Through you, Mr Administrator. I'm, I'm not intimate with the site itself, um, but there's, there's probably a number of sites within the former Gosford area that um, could accommodate smaller lot sizes. As part of the work with the consolidated LEP <coughs> and some of the feedback from the community in terms of the minimum lot sizes, we've decided to run with two uh, minimum lot sizes, uh, one being 550 for the former Gosford and one and 450 for the former Wyong. However, part of the work we will be doing um, in 20, uh, 2021 is the housing strategy um, and rather looking at a blanket uh, minimum lot size across um, the entire central coast. There are opportunities, particularly within the former Gosford area, uh, such as um, perhaps Narara Eco Village and, and, and other sites where it may be potential that a smaller lot size may, may be appropriate. Um, and this will form part of the housing strategy work we'll be doing next year. Well, wasn't Ms. Ms. Arundel talking about 720 metres? It's not really a small lot, is it? No, but, it, but, but there's, there's two re, um, R2 low density uh, lot sizes in the former Gosford, one being the 1850 um, and one being the, the 550. Um, we'll be looking at both the 1850 and the 550s as well on a... On a um, and what, where, time, where it's what time frame will that have? Again, uh, working with the Department of Planning, there is a, 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 an expectation that that work is completed by Christmas 2021. Okay. I uh, don't think it's going to go your way tonight, but it sounds like there's an, a good opportunity to consider the case, and I, I think you'll have a good chance from what I'm hearing. So, sorry we can't help you tonight. Um, Robert Fulcher is withdrawn, so Mr Steed, Ron Steed. Welcome. Thank you. I'm speaking on behalf of uh, four blocks of land, namely 123 Coralta Road, Erina, 125 Coralta Road, 2 Riata Street, Erina, and 4 Kira Street, Erina. Our goal is to achieve rezoning from 7C2 to R1 housing. E4 changes nothing. Does not advantage the zoning as promised at Erin Affair public meetings in 2018, nor respond well to the submissions by SJH Planning in January 2019. Also in 2005, Doug Snedden Planning ran with council from 2009 to 2012 with no imminent result. I say imminent because when I was at the meeting, the mayor said, your rezoning is imminent. Council's response was a failure because of ad hoc, therefore there was no development. Numerous letters were exchanged by council and us, for example, 3rd September 2010 and January 2013 in the Central Coast region strat Regional Strategy. For example, 1.1 Erina, a planning proposal to rezone land on the south side Caralta Road urban zone to be initiated within three months. Um, in 2005, we paid for all technical reports, for example, flora and fauna, etc., with no consequential impediment. There are no creeks run near our land. There has been no bushfire problem here, particularly in 1994, a bad year. 
Rezoning for development would complement the existing development surrounding Erin, a fair shopping centre and entertainment centre. There are about 150 houses opposite me in Tallowood Estate in Caralta Road. Housing development in Bronzewing Estate, with a template I suggested for our proposed rezoning, this has four-storey apartments, mixed housing, townhouses, and a physiotherapist business, opposite the main entry of the traffic lights to Erin Affair Shopping Centre. On January the 10th, 2013, Council offered to do the heavy lifting, Jay McNulty in Council Planning. We had two options and we signed to go with Council. Numbers 89 and 91 Caralta Road acreages went with the New South Wales Government Gateway. The result, they were rezoned. Apartments are now ready to build in 2020. For example, we could be rezoned by spot infill, as happened to these examples. 150 Caralta Road uh, was rezoned with a house and three um, houses built on there. Secondly, Caralta Road, Flakelar Road was closed and two houses were built on that. Three, 7 to 11 Egling Street, which links with Jesse Hurley Road, was subdivided into four lots and four houses added to Tallowood Estate. Mr. Steed, your, your time is actually up. Can you? Oh gosh. Yeah, three minutes is fast. You need to brought, br bring it to a conclusion. I did practice this today. I'm 82 years old and with my timer. But anyway, if I've run out, I well, think. Can you the, just make a concluding comment for 20 or 30 seconds? My concluding comment. Yes. I just wish that, as we are a deferred matter, Mr. Cox you could get your act together and the ad hoc that we've been refused has been caused by planning, not by us, and we want to be included. Okay, thank you very much. I think thank you were you. very clear with that. Thank you. Mr. Cox. Um, through you, Mr. Administrator. Yes, Mr. Seed, I'd, I'd like to see the deferred land matters um, through um, quite quickly as well too. I believe it, it dates back um, to 2005 or even longer, um, uh, we we uh, we one of the uh, recommendations uh, in the report tonight is to commence a planning proposal for the environmental lands review, so we uh, so staff can uh, proceed and um, and complete the deferred matters areas um, hopefully by mid next year. Thank you. I, I listened to the ABC while I was driving here from Sydney this morning. And uh, the local ABC had a, a gentleman on, I don't know if it was yourself, but someone spoke at length. And it certainly has been a long history, and I can understand the frustration. But tonight we, uh, we're likely to be going forward, and, and uh, there will be some legacy issues, and hopefully uh, they won't be lost, and we'll keep moving with them. Uh, Mr. Steed, uh, Mr. Canavan. Sorry, you, where, I've, I've lost pl my place. Are you Mr. Edwards, or? Sorry, Mr. Edwards, I lost my place. Welcome. Okay, thank you. Um, I've changed what I was actually going to say, having listened to what's been going on today, but it still has the same thread, I suppose. Time is money. Please remember this when I'm talking to you. We started in 2006 when the boss, New South Wales, Can you said... stop a minute? We've got a bit of interference coming from somewhere. Is it here? My speaker. Okay, go. Start again. We started in 2006 when the boss, New South Wales, said get your houses in order, local councils, and standardise your LEPs. Five years later, we said, too hard, let's defer this matter. Fast forward to 2014, for some reason, we reviewed it again and said, let's defer it for another five years. Fast forward to July 15, we had another meeting and we said we will prioritise 7C2 and we will definitely sort this matter out and get the sorted and zone approved by, guess, five years. 2017, and we actually got some zones issued and lots of people on the Central Coast applauded. I was one of them. Today, or a week ago, I should say, we got a notice 
that you were about to put through an Ali plea, which still put in deferred matters as not part of the Ali plea. You're now going to leave them to some environmental review performance committee thing, whatever it is. But all you've done is kicked it out again. And you have told us nothing about timing on that. Many owners, I believe, had no issue with the proposed zoning that came up in 2017. Some owners certainly had some issues. Some councillors certainly had some issues. But I don't believe anything's ever been made public about how many people said, that's OK, and how many people objected. What I know is that we're still suffering 14 years onwards, so costs will continue to escalate. Jobs will expand to fill the time available. Joe Taxpayer will cover the costs. So everything's all right in the world of planning and councillors and government. Well, it isn't. It took Thomas Jefferson 17 days to write the Declaration of Independence. The Treaty of Versailles was negotiated and agreed in six months. The Geneva Convention took three years to agree. God save the Queen, because nobody is going to save Joe Taxpayer from incompetent government. Okay. Do you know you finished? I've finished. Thank you very much. I enjoyed that. Thank you. Would you take your seat again? I was waiting to understand the response. I'm going to get the response now. Why are you not Yep, I will get that. And in, in addressing that and others, can you, and there's, remember there's quite a lot of people who will be watching this through the webcast, can you just give a brief explanation of the, the deferred lands issue? Okay, in terms of the deferred lands issue, uh, there's over 4,000 parcels uh, of environmental zones um, and it requires the conversion of uh, uh, former zones into, in, into a, a new hierarchy of environmental zones under the standard LEP instrument. Um, the issue that was identified um, when, when reviewing uh, the deferred lands matters was uh, in terms of the methodology, the original methodology set out under the former Gosford Council didn't allow for split zones um, and also to just following feedback from community consultation and when uh, some ground truthing was undertaken for a, for a number of those 4,000 properties, it was identified that um, what was seen from a desktop and, and constraints mapping analysis is totally different out on the site. So therefore there was the need for some split zoning um, that had to go to make practical decisions um, so that you weren't sterilising complete properties, um, but also too that um, you, were, you were making sure that if it was going to an E2 conservation zone um, that that you were protecting, um, you know, the ecological value of those sites. So it's it's getting closer, and as I said, there's a commitment to complete that work next year. Um, as I said, there just needed to be some refining, um, and particularly with some so of the, you, the can, site can specifics. Can you address why there's been so many five-year extensions? I mean, that does seem like an inordinately long time. Um, I, I personally can't identify, I suppose, just what I'm read. I believe that it was ready to be adopted by the former Gosford Council in 2014 when the Gosford LEP went through and for some reason it was deferred as part of that process. I, I don't know the reason uh, why it was deferred at that time. Um, I, I can only tell you from, you know, from 2017 onwards to where okay. we are now. Mr Ryan, can I invite you in here? I mean, you've seen a lot of planning over many decades. Can, this this does, doesn't sound too impressive. You can understand the frustration. Uh, Mr. Minister, I certainly can, and I don't understand the, the prohibition on split zoning. I think it's often uh, an appropriate tool when you have properties that have different constraints, some environmental and some development, to adapt an appropriate zoning, zoning regime that deals with both those things. Mr. Cox has undertaken that we will have this work completed, and I said earlier, I'll get some of it done as fast as I can on the council-owned land. For the private land, we'll find the appropriate zone or split zones to deal with them in the next six months. Six months? Uh, six months? Yep. Well, or 20 years? I was thinking about like, although the Declaration of Independence in 17 days. It's, it's very impressive and it's fundamental to the American Constitution. It's, uh, it's only taken one president about four years to undermine the lot, but nevertheless, 
uh, we, we watch with interest. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Canavan, welcome back. Oh, we're on. Uh, thanks for having me back. Um, Liz Gabriel uh, won't be speaking after me. Um, she's um, finished I'm watching sorry, I've, I've lost my way a bit, but you are, you're Jonathan Canavan again. I, I am, yeah? yes. And you're speaking in set for Liz Gabriel? No? Uh, well, I'm speaking, but uh, Liz Gabriel has left, so won't be speaking after me. Okay, so right Just clear that yeah. up for you. You don't um, get her time. What's that, sorry? You don't get her time. Oh, <laughs> that's okay. Um, look, I just think we, we support the... Um, the proposed inclusions for the old Sydney town site. And, and in fact, um, uh, this landowner made uh, submissions on the LEP as part of the council process. Um, so I think yeah, we've got good things to say about a process where we made a, a, a um, justified submission and that submission um, was included. And we, so we, we can commend the council staff um, on that basis for, um, for, for logic prevailing in relation to this site. And I just think, Overall, um, particularly for the for the E4 zones, the inclusion of tourism focused uses is, is a massive opportunity for the Central Coast. Um, look, as you know, with six million visitors a year and a population of three hundred eighty thousand, I think the opportunities for tourism are, are the low hanging fruit to help capitalise on opportun uh, employment opportunities and those for economic growth. Um, you know, many of the uses that are, are put forward for this site as additional permitted uses um, form part of our uh, broader vision for the site. Um, you know, they're appropriate for, for the demographic, both locally and internationally. Um, and I think, you know, the, the inclusion of those uses continue to support the ongoing operation of the Australian Reptile Park as well. So um, just wanted to wrap up by saying, you know, thank you for the uh, for hearing that and um, I'd like to commend Scott and his team for, for a logical process. Okay, thank you very much. And the last speaker is uh, Jeremy Quick. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Mr. Administrator and Council staff. Um, I'm representing the owners of the site at Gwondolin, uh, one of them being my elderly father, who sends his apologies. He wanted to be here, but he couldn't make it tonight. Uh, we purchased the property in 2004, and since then we've envisaged providing an exciting and uh, revitalized area for the community. And it's taken 16 years, but uh, we're finally here tonight. Uh, this planning proposal will provide employment and services for the area and for the community. During the years we've conducted surveys and the community have been uh, completely supportive of our proposal. And during the recent public exhibition, there, has, um, there were no objections at all. Uh, we've worked closely with council in this and I think it's resulted in a, uh, a well thought out and considered, and considered plan that benefits the community. I just wanted to thank Council, uh, all the staff, um, for their hard work on this project. And tonight I'm just asking you for your support on approving this planning proposal. Thanks. Thank you very much. So having spent a lot of time listening to people with their concerns, hopefully sorted out a few of them, we'll go to the, the agenda items. Mr Cox, I think we've covered a fair bit about the LEP, but it might be good for you to just speak for a couple of minutes on the, what you think are the, the significant points of uh, putting this through tonight. How will the Central Coast be a better place? Um, thank you, Mr Administrator. I, I suppose there's a, there's, there's a number of um, positives for the, um, for the Central Coast Consolidated LEP. One thing, it simplifies the planning controls and the planning process for, for the Central Coast. Um, staff have had the opportunity to look at the land uses within some of the zones, um, some that were appropriate and some that were not so appropriate. Um, for example, the removal of small lot housing. Um, whilst it, 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 it um, is an important um, tool, particularly with affordable housing, um, with the current controls, um, it, it was causing some concern in the community. Um, the removal of some land uses within some of the environmental zones as well. Uh, they weren't um, compatible. Um, also, too, um, 
the fact that it, we, we were going to get uh, particularly efficiencies in development assessment, um, having staff working with, with a consistent um, set of controls, um, and also to how that can factor into our online assessment tools and our e-planning process going forward. Okay. Mr. Administrator, Please. I just want to make it quite, quite clear. I think myself and Mr. Cox both own properties affected by this instrument. There is no material difference between the zone my house is in now and the zone it's going into. So the public need to understand that. I do have that in the interest. Okay. Yes, I declare as well too. Um, I'd also like to make mention to um, Mr. Administrator that this is stage one of the comprehensive LEP process. Um, and that there is a requirement for the council to deliver its comprehensive LEP over a number of years. As I've mentioned earlier, we'll be starting with uh, the environmental lands review to get some consistency across the central coast with our environmental zones, um, but also to then starting on the housing strategy, then starting on the employment land strategy, um, social planning strategy, heritage strategy, a whole number of strategies rolling out. Um, and this will be, the consolidated yeah. LEP will be the vehicle for those strategies to be uh, implemented into a planning instrument. There's no doubt the, um, there's been a, a, a fair degree of um, well, public uh, disappointment, I think, and frustration at the, uh, the progress of some of these planning matters. Um, obviously, they are, there's a complexity, otherwise they would have sailed through, but I do think uh, that, that public uh, disquiet is something that the um, well, future representatives here need to think a bit about and, uh, and try and keep things moving. Um, having said that, I'm very happy with the, uh, the LEP. I'm pl pleased to be in the chair to, keep, to move this ahead and I move the motions that are on the screen. And <coughs> yep. and I move those and adopt that as a decision of council. I go back to the procedural matters. I, di I did ask for the disclosure of interest, but I possibly moved on, so we probably need to note uh, Mr. Ryan's uh, interest. So uh, there, are, there was a disclosure there, so we need to make an adjustment there that Mr. Ryan declared uh, he lived in a, in a land zone that was affected by this, but he had no, it was no change to his zoning. And Mr. Cox as well. Okay, I move that and adopt that as a decision of council. Uh, there's no matters in closed session uh, tonight, um, but I have a couple of administrators' minutes. And the uh, first is the uh, to do with uh, uh, actually the one to do with the appointment. Oh yes, sorry. One four is the recruitment of an ongoing ch new chief executive officer. There's an administrator's minute available that sets out the process. Uh, I'll be uh, uh, selecting a, a recruit a recruiting firm to assist in making sure we have a top quality field. Uh, I'll be setting up a, a selection committee. Um, uh, Mr. Hart will assist me, and we'll have uh, another experienced person uh, uh, from outside the council helping and um, I'm hoping that we'll uh, get that process moving as fast as possible and maybe have a new person in situ in uh, maybe uh, April, um, hopefully not the 1st of April. Um, but anyway, yeah, I'm pleased to start that process that one of the reasons why I made my previous decisions in this regard so that we could get moving because the most important thing here is to get a strong experience chief executive in place uh, as soon as possible. So I move that um, recommendation and adopt that as a decision of council. The, uh, the next uh, one is a little more uh, complex uh, and it's, a, it's to do with the, uh, the special rate variation application. The, since the last time, only a week ago, that I spoke about this, uh, I'm now of the view that we also need to have considered a higher special rate variation than the 8%, uh, which would be 8% special and 2% inflation. This one uh, will be 13 plus 2. Uh, rate payers will have a chance to comment uh, on this. The reason I formed this view is that, that I thought the projection of the results with the other were very skinny 
uh, and wouldn't last uh, that long or long enough. There's also an assumption in the, in, the, in the material that's put before me which assumes we're going to claw, will claw back some of the IPART water rates decision, which I'm afraid means that some people may pay some more water rates. It's interesting that we have strong reaction against rate increases, but most people probably aren't even aware that the rate water and sewage rate decrease they had last year was bigger than the rate increase we're now, we're now uh, considering. Uh, it's also uh, it's quite hard uh, not only to understand but to explain, but this gets mixed up with the issue of rate harmonisation. When the councils were merged, uh, Wyong residents were paying a higher rate than Gosford residents, and that's caused a fair bit of uh, anger, to be frank. In fact, most of the people I met with at the front tonight uh, for the meeting were, were Wyong residents who felt like they'd been carrying, in their words, Gosford. The government set a time for when that harmonisation could occur, and that time is this coming year. There's, I gather, some consideration on whether they're going to spread that out, out over a period of time. Uh, let's assume they don't, and, and we follow the rules set down by the state government for rate harmonisation. A 15% increase in rates next year would mean average Wyong would pay minus $3 a week, and, and average Gosford would pay plus $7 a week. Um, the, there is built into the, uh, the proposals that are, we're looking at to pro provide further protection for pensioners, which I think most people accept as uh, appropriate. So the decision that's before me tonight is to uh, include two options uh, to go forward with the IPART. Uh, it's the Independent Pricing and Regulatory Tribunal, which has the responsibility for managing special rate applications, and that process uh, will we'll start, we'll now look at the two, the two options, and we'll be doing further work to crunch the numbers, and I'll make them publicly available as soon as we're confident we've got that nailed down, uh, which won't be, won't be very far away, we're talking about a matter of days, uh, in my view. So that uh, Administrator's Minute is now available, uh, and I move the recommendations. I'll just check, do I need to add anything? Um, I move the recommendation to bear and adopt that as a decision of council. Item 2.1 is the business recovery plan. Uh, Ms Cowley, do you want to raise anything here? Thank you, Mr Administrator. Um, the main po points in this You'll report... You'll have to speak up loudly. The main points in this report is that we have um, reduced the capital expenditure budget uh, 270 million. Um, we have uh, obviously, have, as, as you've just mentioned, uh, made a special rate variation um, and we have delivered a structural reduction of uh, employee costs in materials of approximately 50 million and we have approved the f phase one underperforming property assets uh, for sale um, and the point that we had in um, the last recovery plan about negotiations underway for a loan to secure a 50 to 100 million um, dollars loan for, uh, for capital works is still still in progress. Thank you very much. Um, there's a recommendation before us to note the plan. I move that and adopt that as a decision of council. The next item is an investment report, uh, which seems pretty straightforward. Uh, people who uh, aren't familiar with council finances may look at that and see hundreds of millions of dollars in the bank. Can you explain uh, those funds or Mr Hart and why that's not available? Yeah, thank you Mr Mayor. That's uh, one of the intrigues of local government. I don't know whether I've just been promoted or demoted. <laughs> <laughs> um, so one of the mystiques of local government is that we, when we receive income, some of it has to go into reserves for specific purposes such as waste water reserve, sewer reserve, and section 711, which is the old section 94 developer contributions. That money is then has to be invested. And at the moment, what the report is showing that our investments total approximately, well, exactly, I should say, uh, 400 and, uh, 415 billion. That's what our investments show. Our actual restrictions are 447 that means we are actually overspent, if you like, or underrepresented to the tune of $31 million, 
which is a negative, and therefore we have used all our other available cash and we have used up 30 odd $1 million of our restricted funds. So the reason why it looks like we've got a lot of money in the bank, it is simply it is restricted and restricted by law and should not be used to fund the operational side of the business. Thank you very much. Uh, just on the, the previous item, uh, but two on the on the rates question, um, I can understand people's concern about you know any rate increase, particularly in the context where they feel like their elected representatives didn't uh, and and the chief executive particularly didn't uh, represent their interests very well. But I also make the point that that in terms of getting back to a, a uh, to reduce our loss. Next for the next budget, we're in the process of uh, taking out 300 people from the organisation, that, and that's a larger amount of money than we'll get from rate increase revenue. So there is a lot of effort going on to reduce our expenses, as well at the same time as we're looking at increasing rates. And uh, while I can, I have to say I lose more sleep over that one than I do over the rate increase, because while I appreciate that some people will find it hard to pay $7 a week extra, it's, it, on average. Uh, it's a lot harder to lose your job, uh, even though they may walk away initially with a, a payout. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's quite a hard decision, and a lot of hard decisions are being made here, and I just ask the community to understand that and, and realise that uh, we're trying to spread the burden as best we can across uh, both expenses and revenue. Okay, uh, the investment report, I move that, the, uh, that it be noted and adopt that as a decision of council. Uh, policy for investment management, Ms Cowley. Uh, through you, Mr Administrator, uh, this is a, an updated policy uh, for investment management. Some of the key uh, changes have been to realign it with uh, best, best practice and enable council to be able to optimise the return that, it, that Council is able to get from the current investment portfolio. Um, and it also enables the uh, grandfathering of investments like the three that we have in that investment uh, report that we've uh, uh, reported uh, to be able to keep uh, investments that have, that are outside uh, the policy but are still providing us with uh, ac acceptable returns. Thank you. Uh, I'll move the recommendations before us and adopt those as a decision of council. Item 3.1 on the Social Inclusion Advisory Committee uh, recommends the appointment of a new member, Mr Michael Schill. I don't believe we have to speak to the report tonight. I've read the report and discussed it with uh, Ms Vaughan. I move the recommendations for 3.1 and adopt those as a decision of council. Item 3.2 is a meeting a record of the Town Centre Advisory Group Likewise, I've uh, read the report and uh, those interested should do so. I move the uh, recommendation to note and adopt that as a decision of council. Item 3.3 three is uh, a little more substantial in a sense in terms of that it deals with our graffiti strategy. Ms Vaughan, tell us about it. There Thank you, you, Mr Administrator. Yes, um, the Graffiti Management Strategy 2021 to 2024 um, is a new strategy. So in essence, it actually consolidates the two former strategies of both former Gosford and Weil. Um, graffiti is a significant issue for our community and um, heavily impacts both our pride and place from a safety perspective. And whilst our numbers um, of graffiti reporting has reduced, um, that um, is probably, um, or incidences have reduced, that's um, as a result we believe heavily um, due to the increased level of reporting. So the strategy being based on best practice and um, considered the successes of both former strategies. Um, there's five key themes which is um, focusing on rapid response. Um, it's about partnerships particularly with the volunteers, police and um, other um, corrective service agencies. It's about reporting and the ease of that. Um, it's about legitimising art, um, specifically public art, and ensuring that we have prevention through crime prevention strategies and education. So this report is to present um, the completed strategy following exhibition phase. There were 19 submissions that were um, received. Um, it's pleasing to note that um, it, we only required um, a very small amendments to the strategy. Um, all of the feedback that was provided was consistent with the um, draft submission that had been developed um, in consultation. 
Again, key focus is on the reporting and um, potential prosecution, huge support around the rapid removal and le legitimising of art. So um, it is a three-year strategy um, and will be implemented accordingly both um, through Council's resources but also in partnership with community businesses and police. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I move the recommendation. Congratulations to you and your staff and uh, I adopt those as a decision of Council. We've done 4-1, the LEP, so we're going to move on to 4-2, Coastal Zone Management Plan and the Emergency Action Subplan. Mr Cox. Through you, Mr Administrator, this is uh, an information report in response to a number of councillor resolutions earlier on in the year. Um, firstly, um, it identifies the roles and responsibilities of council and government agencies when there's an emergency at play. Um, particularly when a natural disaster has been declared. Um, it also gives an update um, for the community uh, in terms of the coastal zone management plans, particularly for the Gosford coastal zone, app, um, coastal zone management plan. Uh, there's a number of actions in there and it identifies what works have been complete and, and what works are ongoing. Um, and lastly, just it gives an update, particularly in terms of the recovery of the emergency works, which were done at uh, North Entrance and, and Womberall earlier on in the year. Thank you. Just going to make a few comments about this whole issue. Um, I, uh, as I've mentioned before, I've been to three councils administrator, and all of them have significant coastal erosion problems, probably nowhere as great as Womberall, uh, but Collaroy uh, certainly serious, Lake Katai and, and Port Macquarie Hastings are serious. Um, I watched the news tonight. I don't know if people had a chance to watch the news and saw that most of Byron Bay beachfront is gone. Uh, and uh, we're not just talking about a little bit. Uh, it's uh, not, and not just a bit, uh, but uh, uh, the far end that, that uh, houses were lost some years ago, it's right along the beachfront. Uh, this is increasingly occurring all over the country. I had a meeting with a state government representative who's a public servant who's been given the task of trying to coordinate um, I was uh, at, at uh, Northern Beaches Council four years ago um, and uh, after in my second week there, uh, you'd all remember this famous photo of the swimming pool on the beach as the, as the east, coast, as east Coast Low struck the, the 12 odd houses there. Uh, that's still not resolved. It's almost resolved four years later in terms of just dealing with the ridiculous uh, interdepartmental obstructions within the state government. Um, particularly the Lands Department. Uh, we have those sort of frustrations here with Womble, in my view. Um, we have no presence of the federal government at all in these issues. When I was at Northern Beaches, I wrote to the Prime Minister, uh, pointing out that this was now becoming a national problem. Um, it got the response that I suppose I should have expected, which was nothing, nothing at all. Um, a low level public servant wrote back saying this was a matter for the states. Uh, this is a matter, matter for some national leadership we have serious coastal erosion occurring. And the, uh, the people who have looked into it, like myself, uh, the country's most eminent expert, uh, Mr Angus Gordon, uh, everyone who looks into it agrees that offshore beach nourishment from offshore sources is going to be necessary. Otherwise, we're just going to end up with walls with no beach in front of them, which is very unsatisfactory in many cases, or, or a retreat where houses are, are washed away and. Uh, People lose everything and eventually they get to a road or something so it becomes a problem then. Uh, it's just not satisfactory for this to go on like it is. I don't know what I can do about it but I make a commitment uh, tonight that I'll up my ante to, to, to see. I, I don't think writing another letter to the Prime Minister but I'll be speaking often about this. Uh, but uh, there really is a need for some national leadership and also some state leadership to get into this issue at, at the highest level, not just... Uh, leaving it to inter interdepartmental committees to, to fight about the Department of Land's policy that doesn't allow walls to be built on their land and uh, whatever. The, the, the question of payment is still unresolved. I, I found myself having to set my own policy uh, in the Northern Beaches four years ago um, and that was 80% uh, of the money would be paid by the landowner, 10% by the state and 10% by the council. Um, and that will cre create some financing problems for the, some of the landowners because not everyone who lives on the waterfront has got a lot of money. Uh, but we, can't, we overcame that problem with a financial structure. Uh, it can be done. Wombrel is probably more expensive than, than the Collaroy, given the size of the escarpment and the, uh, the extent of the problem. But 
it's a uh, Collaroy is just one of many. Uh, we've got the problem up and down the coast around to South Australia, and so I'm going to uh, just uh, vent, vent here. I feel a bit better for venting, uh, but there really is a need uh, for some national leadership, and uh, I'll be looking to see all that I can do, which is not a lot, but I'm going to I'm going to raise it now because I've I've. Uh, I was angry as hell, <laughs> and someone's got to do something more than what's being done now. Uh, thank you for your report, uh, which is totally consistent with what I'm saying. Not much is happening, <laughs> and I move that uh, and adopt that as a decision of council. The uh, item uh, four three uh, is activities of the development assessment unit. Do you want to speak to that, Mr. Cox? Or is it I thought it was pretty straightforward. I ju I'm just going to note the report and move its adoption. Do that as a decision of council. 4-4 okay. uh, four, is about putting some, uh, replacing the council representatives on the regional planning panel. You've come up with some names. Uh, do you want to explain briefly how they were, they were got to? Uh, sure, Mr. Administrator. Um, the Hunter Central Coast Regional Planning Panel has uh, two council delegates um, positions on it um, with the suspension of the councillors that, that left two vacancies. Um, so we, we've recommended, staff are recommending that um, a number of representatives from the local planning panel uh, be appointed uh, to the Hunter Central Coast Regional Planning Panel. Uh, they were chosen uh, based on the requirements of the, of the Act, which, which states that it can be only two um, delegates um, plus alternate um, so we've chosen two community reps and also two professional reps to uh, take the place of uh, what was uh, originally taken by the councillors. Okay, thank you. I'm, I'm a strong supporter of regional planning panels and planning panels generally, and uh, the councillors aren't available at the moment, so I'm, I'm happy with the representatives you put forward. I move the recommendations and adopt those as a decision of council. Uh, we've got a planning proposal, item 4-5, which was the Parowina Road, Wonderland. Mr Cox. Uh, through you, Mr Administrator. The report seeks to permit a new uh, centre at Gwondolin, comprising commercial and residential uses, including a supermarket, retail shop, service station, village green, a town square, child, child care centre, medical centre and residential housing. Um, I suppose that this is a good example where some pre-planning and some um, visionary planning and structure planning come into to play. Uh, the North, North Wyong structure plan was developed in 2012. It identified a need for a town centre um, in the Gwondolin area, uh, and this rezoning will be converting vacant industrial land um, that had not been developed um, into a, a, a commercial space that can give a feel of a, of, of a meeting place or a town centre for the uh, suburbs of Gwondolin and uh, Summerland Point. Thank you very much. I'm happy to support the recommendations you put forward. I move those and adopt that as a decision of council. The minutes of the Audit and Risk Improvement Committee have been tabled. I'm happy with those. I adopt those as a decision of council, the recommendation to note. Um, meeting record of the Heritage Advisory Committee. Likewise, I'm happy to note the minutes. That brings me to the end of the formal agenda. I now declare the meeting closed. Thank you for attendance and look forward to the next time. Thank you.